My name is Stalin Sword. I have the great pleasure to sit here with uh, Thomas Sterner, mm. Professor of Environmental Economics. Yes. It's a subject that is not, not too old. No. About 50 years? Yeah, about years. 50 years, 60 years in the US. So and, you're, uh, you're, you're almost the same age as yes. uh, the subject itself. Resources for the Future was actually started in the US in 1952 when I was born. Yeah. Um, and you yourself, your, your PhD, you kind of uh, you merged around it. It was about, you were working with Mexico. That's and, right. And uh, how sheep crude and how sheep oil affects the, 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 the economy and the country mm. itself. But you couldn't call it uh, environment, environment, environmental uh, economics. You, you had to call it uh, uh, energy economics. That's right. Uh, environmental economics was not considered a, a subject in, at the time in, in Gothenburg, but um, my interest was, was environmental. So I, I kind of uh, started the subject by uh, you know, by just working on issues that were important for the environment, uh, but I I told my supervisor in the department that this is energy economics. Yeah, that was kind of accepted. And some subjects like chemistry, for example, had its you know its high high peak in the fifties. But your subject has really gone to today. It's more more. Uh, more important than ever. Yeah, we, ha we, <laughs> we have a lot of success in a rather perverse way. I mean, we, we just... Yeah. I, I was in, actually in a, a host, a, for, a, um, host for the uh, World Conference of Environmental Economics. Mm -hmm. And we were 1,500 in Gothenburg. The first conference in Venice, we were about 50 people in 1990. Yeah. And so we have a lot of success in that, in that sense. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have less success in dealing with the real world. Mm. We're, we're not solving problems as fast as we should. Mm. We're, and, and you yourself, you grew up in London. Yep. It's a town affected by environment as well. Indeed. Uh, maybe I got some inspiration. Maybe I got some inspiration there because when I was a kid, we had the famous London fogs. Yeah. And uh, quite a few thousand people died on one or two days, uh, in particular with, uh, with the London smog. Yeah. And I remember walking to school and I had to hold the wall all the way because otherwise if you, you could drift out and kind of get lost because you, visibility was just about so you could, we could see each other but yeah. I wouldn't see, you know, like, you couldn't see more than like two yards. Yeah. And your, your stepfather, he was... Uh, uh, he had Einstein and Röntgen as uh, teachers. teachers. Yes, he did. So he, 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 you can't have a better education than that. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that was his education. <laughs> yeah. Did he, uh, did he uh, share some memories with you? Oh, he did. He did. He loved to lecture at home. <laughs> yes. And uh, how, how, how was to grow up in a, in a home like that? Did you get uh, because well, you, you got an elite education in London at yeah. Westminster? Yes, my school was uh, was uh, was great. Um, I just didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it so much. Mm. There were uh, it was very snobby. It was all male. Uh, lots of strict rules. It was a major disaster if your tie was not nicely tied. And yeah. If your shoes. Were That's why you tied. don't have a jacket anymore. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I've become a little bit <laughs> anti, anti on those things. Um, <clears throat> but the, the knowledge was fantastic. We we had lasers and even computer and stuff to play with in the sixties, and you know this was 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 very early. The, Lots of teachers who could have been professors at the university. They, they, the, the standards of the academically was was great. It's just mm. that they were not always nice people. And you came to to uh, get grip of a lot of languages. You speak fluent Spanish and uh, French and English and Swedish. Yeah, well, I've just lived in many different countries. Because, German. Uh, yeah. So I well, my stepfather was German. We used to speak German. Uh -huh. And then I lived in Innsbruck and did some skiing. Yeah. And then I lived in France. I've lived three times in France throughout my life, different periods. And, and I've lived in Mexico and the US. And so I just uh, move around and, um, and then you pick up languages. And do you, do you see, because economics and, and the 
and the environment is, is, is global. Mm. It connects everyone and, and everyone is affected by it. Mm. Uh, having lived in different countries, are you, are you able to put the pieces together? Yeah, I think that's an important aspect, actually, because, because it's not really the environment that causes problems. It's people who cause problems and cause environmental problems. And we need to understand uh, economics and politics. And, and that understanding is, is different and it's context dependent. So we need to understand that politics is different in the US or in Mexico than it is in England or France. Oh. And it's often a matter of culture. It's very much a matter of culture and uh, the way people protest, the way people vote, the, the kind of politicians you have. In some countries the politicians come from the elite and are very intelligent and well educated. In mm -hmm. other countries they are uh, much more regular people. And how come sometimes intelligent people doesn't make wise decisions? <laughs> but common people... Often, I mean, oh, indeed, they... indeed. Well, that's uh, that's um, it's maybe hard to generalize, but uh, we see today a lot of uh, world leaders who um, are perhaps very polarizing. Uh, sometimes, uh, I think, uh, really in the hands of lobbyists, or they represent special interests. Mm. And so their policies are, are not wise, but the, the, they personally might be intelligent. But, and uh, uh, and uh, since uh, green tech is growing, mm -hmm. it's a hot spot. It was it a few years ago, and then it kind of died off. And now it's it's a bit like uh, the, the 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 computer sector, the IT com sector in the year two thousand. It was hotter than ever. Then it died, and now it's hotter than ever again with AI and so on. Mm -hmm. And, and it's the same thing happening with the green tech. Yeah. Solar I, panels and the wind turbines and... The yeah, I think there's a lot of... Uh, batteries uh, and... Uh, quite a lot of buzz around these things. And, uh, of course, as soon as you sort of solve one thing, like, like solar power, and you get really good cells that are uh, producing well and, and being deployed, and then suddenly you get the next problem, you need storage, and then, and then you, uh, you know or you need transmission, or you need something else. So, so then focus is turned to that problem. And, I mean, in many cases, these things are solvable. If you put resources into them, you get, uh, you get technical development. Mm. And young people today who want to work in the environmental sector, mm. where, where, where should they go? Where should they aim? Mm, that's a difficult one, because... Because sometimes things are unexpected, right? Some things are software, some things are culture, some things are... Uh, so there's, I think there's many, many places to go to. Sometimes people uh, paint a picture of a world that if the world is going to be environmental, that it's somehow going to be less dynamic and less exciting and less... And I, and I don't think so at all. There will be plenty of progress and... Um, what, what the economists call growth, uh, even in, in a sustainable society. And there are plenty of interesting challenges, how to provide better health care and nutrition in poor countries, how to develop uh, buildings that don't require energy, that support themselves with energy, how to um, <clears throat> medical technology, all kinds of things um, that... that do not destroy the environment and uh, do not uh, increase global warming or other environmental problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few years ago you were working in the US. You lived in New York mm -hmm. working with the environmental, environmental Defense Fund. Yes. It sounds a bit like uh, it's uh, a <laughs> defense, but how were you able to defend the nature there? Well, it's a it's a paradox. There's a lot of there's a lot of people who are green, and uh, sometimes in the middle of the big stone uh, desert, there you you get these uh, markets for locally produced ecological f <laughs> food, mm. and it's a bit of a contradiction when you're in the middle of Manhattan. But uh, but there are people with a lot of interest in the environment there, and the Environmental Defense Fund is um, is an organization uh, built to fight. Uh, to fight some of the biggest lobbies in the world, the, the lobbies for, uh, you know, for 
the coal industry, the oil industry, the uh, chemical industry and so on, and to fight for a better world. And it was founded by a few lawyers yep. in the 60s. environmental so. lawyers in the 60s. And, and today, how is it found? Because it has 500 uh, employees. Yeah. I, I, I think uh, today it was 500 when I was there, and it's growing fast. Uh, it grew paradoxically quite a lot the last few years as a result of, of Democrats wanting to fight back against uh, Trump, I think. And um, they have a budget of a couple of hundred million dollars. Mm. It's, um, it's, it's, it, you know, a membership list of supporters of over a million people. There's a, a, a lot of, a lot of um, support and a, and a lot of tough um, fighting against mm. big corporations and sometimes cooperation with big corporations as well. And uh, what were you, your own contribution to? Well, I was the chief economist for a, uh, so, uh, so uh, for instance, I built a, a model with, with my staff uh, to <clears throat> sort of predict what would happen with the carbon tax in the United States of a carbon tax of five or ten dollars, and then I had the, the pleasure, it's, it's a joy for a, a European, uh, to go to Capitol Hill and meet uh, congressmen or senators and uh, explain to them that we, we have a proposal here, you know, a, a five dollar carbon tax would give this much revenue. At the time, the government was being shut down because they didn't have funds and they, and they couldn't agree in Congress on... on uh, taxes and things. And so um, typically the, the politicians would say, well, that that's, that's would be a useful amount of revenue and it's good for the climate. And, but then they would say, this is, must be politically impossible, such a high carbon tax, what would people say? And then I used to say, well, um, I don't know if I understand really, because I come from a country where we have a carbon tax of $168 once at the time. Mm. Uh, and nobody thinks about it. It's not like Swedes wake up every morning and think, oh, I, I can't even get out of bed. Life is so miserable because we have this carbon tax. Uh, people don't know we have a carbon tax. Mm. It transformed the economy. Yeah, the so economy is transformed. So we, we, we heat our houses with, uh, with district heating and in the countryside people use wood chips and, and uh, heat pumps and other, other things. We don't burn oil to heat houses anymore like we did in the 60s, because there are other technologies that are just as good and mm. cheaper because of mm. our carbon tax. <laughs> so we adapt. Mm. It's, it's not such a big deal. People can adapt. And if we had a global carbon tax, a global, if, if, if the oil was the same tax in every country, mm. how would that affect the world? Well, I think if it was as high a tax as we have in Sweden, or maybe even just half that level, we would solve climate change. The problem, that problem would, uh, would be quite quickly and cheaply solved. So it is a little frustrating to know that there is a good solution and then to see, like in France, we are currently, there is a struggle. France is really exciting at the moment because uh, the presidents Hollande and Macron, they have... Uh, decided to copy the Swedish carbon tax, which is the second country and a much more bigger and more important country. If they do it the same thing, eh, the world will notice. But today people are uh, demonstrating all over France in the streets. They think of this as a gasoline tax, uh, but it is actually a carbon tax, and they are uh, fighting against it, and it hasn't been explained properly. It hasn't been presented in a, in a, in a good manner. Mm. And so that's the most important fight to watch at the moment. Because if, if you have a tax on, on income, for example, mm. you, you tax rich people to, to give to poor, poor people. But, mm. if you, but if you tax carbon, then everyone is taxed and everyone is given back to. So there's, there's no, not so much losers, so to say, in, in the carbon tax uh, world. Yeah, every tax has its problems. There are, if you have an income tax, or if you have a value-added tax, or if you have a house tax, a property tax, there are some problems with each tax, and there are with with the with the carbon taxes as well. But as a 
as a portfolio of taxes, if you have some taxation on carbon, then you can have less taxation on, on something else, on, on income, on, on entrepreneurship, on imports, or on technology. And you can actually get a much better mix of taxes in, mm. uh, that is more fair. And uh, so it is, it is possible to, to solve this. It's like having a high tax on sugar and a low tax on, on fresh greens. Yes, well, exactly. That's, that's good for you. And of course, there are some people who would like to drink a lot of Coca-Cola. They would be upset, but it's good for them too. Mm. <laughs> so it's, uh... um, and and uh, you have written some papers about how, uh, how uh, a high oil tax affects uh, poor people. Yes, one book called... Uh, Uh, fuel taxes and the poor, because I noticed I've been I've been arguing in favor of higher gasoline taxes or fuel taxes or or carbon taxes all my life, and um, <clears throat> I noticed that this is not always popular. I, and some ministers who have followed my advice they end up in trouble because uh, uh-huh. they demonstrate against them uh, and they get uh, lose power. And, um, <clears throat> and so I, I I try to listen to them to the people who don't agree with me, and uh, I found that the best argument they had was that this is bad for the poor. It is an argument that I respect and that I worry about, because I I don't want to hurt the poor. So I decided to investigate this and write a book about it, and I found that actually in most countries, gasoline taxes are good for the poor. Mm. Uh, Because in most countries, and that is the poor countries in the world in particular, the low- and middle-income countries, it is rich people who have cars. And so a gasoline tax is like a diamond tax or a, you know, a perfume tax or something. It is a tax on th- things rich people use. And so it's both good for the environment and it's also quite fair from a social point of view. Mm. This is not true in the United States, because in the United States it's actually the um, poorest people who spend most of their income on gasoline. So there you have to be a little bit careful. It does depend on which country you're in. Mm. But So if you're in the United States and you increase the gasoline tax, maybe you want to reduce some other tax that is on food or something else that mm. the poor people uh, spend a lot of money on. And then you make sure that the whole tax reform package that you introduce is overall is good for the poor or at least not bad for the poor mm, mm. and your investigation in mexico uh show that you know developing countries that are having sheep sheep oil is it's not so productive in the long term for for the country no exactly there, there is something like dutch which we call Dutch disease, that uh, um, affects countries like Mexico. And I, I lived there in, in around 1980, and I wrote my PhD thesis there. And um, <clears throat> you could see that uh, all smart people want to do work for Pemex. Mm. <laughs> and all the best people go into the oil sector. The oil sector is, makes so much money that the peso... The Mexican uh, currency is a little bit too high valued. And this means that if someone wants to produce films or make shirts or tomatoes or something else, that is rather hard to compete. Mm. Uh, and so everything else becomes unprofitable. The only thing that is profitable is like oil and petrochemistry and a few other re- related industries. So everything goes into the sector and the whole economy becomes like, they call it Petrolizado, you know, mm. Uh, mm. affected by the oil boom, and um, it's it's uh, this is something that you need to be careful with if you're running in a country mm. with oil. And in the other end, you see like Norway, yeah. who has been investing the, the 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 profits from the oil sector for decades. Yes, they have been. Norway was already a well-established state with a lot of good institutions, a lot of good economists before they found the oil, and they quickly realized they had to do something to neutralize this flow of revenue. They put a large share of it into an oil fund. They avoid spending too much of it. They, petrol is, is not cheaper in Norway than it is in Sweden. They, they, so they've done a lot of wise things mm. uh, to manage this wealth. And so what, what, what would be the decisions the world has to make in order to, to you know... Uh, hit the right goals for the for the 
global environment and, and still don't hurt the economy too bad. Yeah, well, we have a, a lot of environmental problems, but starting with climate change, we need to put a price on carbon. That's the most important thing to do. It doesn't have to be as high as the carbon tax in Sweden, but at least like a half that level or a third of that level would be a good start. That has to be done quite urgently. Uh, we have to stop the expansion. There, there are plans to build hundreds of new power plants based on coal in countries ranging from Turkey to, to you know, in Africa to Asia. This needs to be stopped. Uh, really today, solar plants, wind plants are uh, just as cheap, sometimes cheaper. And with a small carbon tax, this will become you know, clear to the power plants and in, in the governments all over the world. And we really, that's a, a very important first step to move into and speed up the transition in, into, into solar and wind power. Mm. Mm. And what would be the, the, the second step? Well, there's quite a, uh, quite a number of second steps. Another big, important um, sector, you know, is, is uh, our food. About a quarter, a fifth, a quarter of our, of our carbon, of our climate footprint mm. comes from what we eat. And the main responsibility there, is, but not the only one, but the main one is actually ruminant uh, meat, like from cows, for instance. And it's actually not carbon dioxide, it's methane, that is a much more powerful uh, mm. gas. We need to uh, limit uh, our, our consumption of, of meat and uh, even cheese, which I hate to say because I love cheese myself. Mm. <laughs> but but we, this is, you know, there, there are many uh, other second steps. There is, is our traveling, our, uh, we, we, you know, air flight, for instance, is, 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 a, is a growing contributor to climate change. There is, um, uh, we need to build homes that don't need a lot of external energy, but that are basically with good architecture, good insulation in cold climates and uh, good ventilation and, uh, and so in warm climates, makes them uh, more or less climate neutral so that they, they don't need a lot of external energy. Then we need to build uh, a car fleet that basically runs on renewable power and we need to uh, challenges when it comes to batteries and mm. uh, transmission and uh, well, a lot of good and, challenges. And uh, globally, what, what, what are you know, the, the, the positive sites that you see? What, 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 what uh, inspires you that tomorrow will be better than today? Well, there are uh, many things, but I mean, certainly one thing is, is um, you know, is the solar revolution. It's, it's fantastic to see that uh, that so you can produce even in in, in our cold country, <laughs> which uh, doesn't you can produce solar power uh, commercially. That's fantastic. But there's also all kinds. There's new ways of doing agriculture. People do vertical agriculture in cities. Mm. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of new exciting technology when it comes. People are starting to make cement and steel without carbon emissions through new, new chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, there's new textiles, new materials, things that have some of the properties of plastic. Mm. You know, we have. I mean, plastic has rather nice, useful properties like mm. water resistance and what, it's water repellent and water resistance and water containing and so on. You can get some of that and still make the materials degradable yeah. and not based on fossil uh, sources. And uh, your son, he just took a PhD yes. in, in, in environment, environment and uh, in research. Climate the, research, yeah. Yeah, climate research. This, is this weekend and you brought his sheets from his party <laughs> to my house here. Uh, tell us about his, his research. This is Eric Steiner. Uh, and um, he started off in uh, physical resource theory at Chalmers, uh, wrote a couple of chapters. Uh, he was originally doing research on black carbon, but quickly got interested in the question of metrics, which is how, how much uh, 
in carbon dioxide is the equivalent of, of, of one kilo of methane or of black carbon or of nitrous oxide or some other climate gas. So he wrote two chapters about that. Mm. Then he wrote, then he said that this problem is so urgent, we can't wait, we, we, we know enough. Uh, the main problem is how to communicate this to persuade people because we are in such a hurry. So he, he moved over into more like communication and teaching. Mm. And in between, he also wrote one paper in economics with a couple of colleagues of mine. So, mm. so it's a very broad thesis. It's really brilliant to have uh, psychology and teaching and education, communication sciences, and then have physics and then have economics and mm. uh, other theses. Mm. And uh, you have lived in a, quite a lot of different countries. Mm. Uh, you were quite recently in France, and uh, you. College de France. Yes. It's this an honor in, in uh, France. Uh, yes, I was extremely uh, proud. This is uh, um, an incredible honor in France to, to get elected into the College de France. Uh, it's, it's a big institution. There's, uh, there's a thousand professors who like res do research there, but there are only like 60 professors who are the, um, really are the professor. College de France, mm. and they um, are elected for life generally, but there are one or two positions that are sort of yearly positions, and I got elected to one of those. Mm. And so my job there was to give nine lectures, but they told me they have to be in very beautiful French, <laughs> yeah. so that was a challenge. <laughs> yeah, and, and your lectures, what did they? They were on policy instruments, the design of policy instruments. So uh, the first one was very general about the design of policy instruments. And then I spoke about different aspects of, of, of you know, discounting and long-run problems with, with costs in the future or, or problems mm. when you have political power, when the, when the um, polluters are too powerful and so you can't tax them, uh, oh, and all kinds of... In, individual special problems when you can't measure the pollutant or when there's asymmetric information mm. what you do when in different kinds of situation mm. and the re recent uh, Nobel Prize winner you, you had a, a little controversy with well I mean he, he's a he's a, 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 a fine researcher a fantastic you know recipient of the of the prize and and a gentleman and so I, I happen to have written quite a few articles where I criticized him but that's because he's an important person I wouldn't want to waste my time criticizing you know someone unimportant <laughs> but and, and I I do I mean I, I I believe that you know that that he has provided the platform for analyzing uh, climate uh, in, in, you know, climate economics, and I have suggested some ways to um, uh, make improvements to the discounting and the and the kind of damage function used in his model. And uh, he has always uh, taken a polite interest and uh, uh, listened. And then he, uh, well, and he typically has his own opinion as well, of course. Yeah, <laughs> and and your 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 main core issues here. What are, what are they? Well, so I believe that such a long-run important issue as, as climate change, which is something that lasts a whole century, and in fact not just one century, but multiple, multiple thousands of years, we are committing the planet to a, to a different path. And then we can't use the conventional discounting, because with conventional discounting of 3%, then any century, anything that happens after the year 2100 is is uninteresting for the calculation. It becomes so small in, in conventional discounting. And I think that is wrong. I think it, it rests on the assumption that we will grow forever. Mm. And I don't think... Well, I was going to say I don't think we can grow forever. Actually, I think in a way we can. We can grow forever, but only in some sectors. So medical technology or computer games or something, they can go on growing forever. Mm. <clears throat> but the amount of steel we produce cannot go on growing. The amount of uh, petrol we use must decrease. Uh, the coral reefs will not grow, they will disappear. We know that. So there are a lot of things that, uh, a lot of structural change in the future, and this has to be reflected in uh, different discount rates for different sectors, like uh, the introduction of relative prices. Mm. So we know that 
land in Bangladesh will be drowned by, by sea level rise. So this means that the price of land will rise. We need to take this into account. We can't use the conventional discounting over the whole economy without thinking. That's one point where I differ. And then another one is that I think that the damages, we are just discovering the damages because, well, it's hard to know what the damage, we don't know what will happen. It's a big experiment. But the last time we had 400 parts per million carbon in the atmosphere was several million years ago and we had 25 meters higher sea level. And it's quite likely that that will happen now as well, but it, it may take a few hundred years. Mm. And it's really hard to calculate what the cost of this is. But new research is finding that the damage co costs are higher than, than what, mm. what was believed just a few years ago. And I think that uh, Nordhaus's values need to be updated to reflect this. And your, in your model, you would differentiate 3.5% <clears throat> here, 1% there. But how... I asked you before, how are we able to anticipate the different growth rates in, in different areas of, of the economy? This is very hard. Uh, so there's a lot more uh, exciting, uh, difficult research to do. Um, some of this uncertainty is within economics itself, but some of it is also natural science research. We need the, the physicists and the geoscientists to tell us how fast will the sea level rise and so on. And they, they don't quite know yet. Oh. So, so some of the uncertainty is, is real natural science uncertainty as well, and, and um, there's a lot more work to be done. But we are finding, we are finding all kinds of new problems, like invasive species. We we have already got ticks that uh, that carry a lot of disease that we have discovered here in, in, mm. in Sweden. Uh, soon we may be getting malaria and other Indian. Start thinking about it. What, what are the costs of these things? They they can be quite high. Mm. Yeah. And you started early on as a boy to uh, fish with nets. Yes. Um, your your mother's mother had a little house in Marstrand. Yeah. Outside Gothenburg, uh, at the west coast of Sweden, and. Uh, but you got bigger fishes than they, than you get today, and you yes. have done some research on on, the, on fish and the future of the econo economics of the sea. Yes, I used to take my students when I gave a course in natural resource economics. I took them to a marine research station, partly because I wanted them to meet some natural scientists as well, but also because it made a nice break, a nice weekend, and um, and I got to know more and more, and I I. I um, you know, so I made friends with some marine biologists and, and learned uh, a lot and, uh, and found that what I had been doing is actually how the marine biologists do when they want to measure the stock of fish. They use old fishing methods in the same place every year because that way you can see really the effect of the stock decline. Yeah. And I've always been fishing in the same place since I was 15, yeah. and one little bay on one little island so was the same kind of Is it of your responsibility that is less fish now? Well, in that, in, that, in, that little, in, in that little bay, <laughs> in that one particular yeah. spot maybe, but, uh, but uh, there's a lot of people fishing too much. Um, there's the commercial fishing, but there's also recreational fishing and subsistence fishing. And the technology gets better and better. And normally we like technology. Better technology is good, but... When it comes to fishing, if you mm. have better technology and free access and nobody owns the resource, uh, then you can easily get overfishing. It's mm. really a problem of free access. This would never happen in a lake that belonged to someone. Mm. If there was one owner, he wouldn't like empty the lake this year because he knows that he wants to keep some fish for next year. Yeah. But in the sea, with many people having access to the same fishing water, everybody thinks that there's no point in me restraining my fishing because someone else will fish instead. Mm. And so everybody fishes too much with better and better technology. And the result is that we in, in Boisland don't have much fish left anymore. There's crabs and we have oysters nowadays. So we have an invasion of new oysters. Mm. Um, but there's, there's no cod, no place, no Dover stone, no, the traditional species, white thing and so on. They are basically gone. There is one left, which is um, 
a uh, salmon species mm. uh, that is solitary, so it, it doesn't congregate. You don't go around in shoals, they, and they go quite close to the coast, very close to the coast, just a few meters from, from... And they are not easily caught by trolls or anything. And what can the fishing industry learn from, from uh, your research? Well, I think the fishing industry, the fishing industry needs to um, to be to be regulated and to to stop fishing so much. It is in their own interest, um, and they have been locked in a rather unproductive struggle with the regulators. I think that perhaps the best thing to do would be to give the fishermen more uh, say collectively. In, not individually, each one. You can't tell each one to fish as much as he likes, but you can give the fishermen tradable quotas so mm. that they own the resource. Then it would be in their interest collectively to make sure that they don't fish too much. Mm. And it's more positive than a tax on the industry. Yes, exactly. That, that wouldn't be very popular, unfortunately. Mm. And when you have the same uh, level playing field mm. for everyone... For example, with a carbon carbon tax, I, I guess it creates more entrepreneurs. Yes, if you have big, big, big industry, big oil giants, big coal giants, it doesn't create so many small entrepreneurs, and and it's the small entrepreneurs that drives new jobs in the in the economy as a yeah. whole. We have found this with tradable uh, quotas in in many countries. That uh, <clears throat> there are famous examples from. Halibut industry in, in, in the US, for instance, that they used to be regulated by number of fishing days. And uh, the production, the productivity of the fleet was such that in the end they took the whole year's harvest in two days. And then the fishing was closed for the rest of the year. Mm. This meant that those two days, if it was the 1st and 2nd of February or wherever it was, you had all the fish caught. Mm. And the that's not a good way. Then, then you have to sell frozen fish all year. <laughs> and mm. uh, uh, now that they have a security of tenure and they have a, a quota that they can fish, they can choose to fish it. And maybe, maybe Easter or Christmas or some other, you know, mm. getting the right time of, of when when the fish are nice and when the customers are hungry or have, you know, major holidays or whatever, uh, you get a, a higher price and mm. you get better quality and you get the fish, you know, can, you can plan, you can collaborate with restaurants and you supply a certain mm. number of fish to good restaurants uh, uh, once a week, yeah, whatever. It's much better than just racing out and catching everything in one or two days, which is mm. a disaster from the point of view of fish management. And, and you have three sons, one is working with making movies and another one who's selling fish. Yes, indeed, one is well, other one is selling fish. What have you learned? Uh, well, he, he goes around, he, he might come and knock your door one day because he, mm. he, he comes and he knocks the door of... Uh, of people and uh, he's uh, taught me a lot about uh, you know about how to sell and he says that he, he you don't start by talking about the fish you have to you have to sort of see what kind of a person this is so so he start talking about football or, or mm -hmm. garden management or kids or something depending on what he what he thinks you have to quickly judge and make contact and, oh. uh, so so it's uh, salesmanship is, is also an art in itself and and uh, how are we able to to kind of enjoy good things without having you know anxiety about it? There's a lot of climate anxiety now. People have anxiety when they eat fish and yes. And so on. How, how can you combine a good life with with a good future? Yeah, well, the anxiety is in a way is is good and appropriate. Uh, we, we we have a lot of um, dangers ahead. But on the other hand, actually the state of anxiety itself, you have to use it for something. In itself, it is unproductive. If, if this just makes you uh, feel bad and then you kind of stay at home and drink or something because you're, mm. you, you're in a state of anxiety, that's not very helpful. It's better to actually uh, enjoy uh, fish more seldom than, than you know, eat a good fish sometimes um, and enjoy it 
and then do something to try to improve the, the world. I mean, we, we need more engaged citizens. It's better oh. to be engaged and then every now and then enjoy yourself than just, just anxiety itself is, can be destructive. And young people today who want to study and who want to do research in your, in your, mm. in your field, what, what, what would be the three best pieces of advice you could give to them? Well, it's very important that everyone chooses what they really want to do themselves. Some people are better at selling, some people are better at uh, speaking. Uh, you know, um, we need people who are activists in the streets, but we also need lawyers who will sit and hammer out little details of, of laws and agreements. And we need economists and we need journalists and we need lobbyists, green lobbyists. And we, we need all kinds of things. And amongst the researchers, some people really like to, to do the maths and some people like doing statistics. Some people are good at writing. Uh, some people uh, like doing interviews and some other people like sitting in front of the computer. It's very important that everyone... Um, there I'm really in favor of, you know, of liberty and freedom. Mm. You have to find your own, your own choice and your own um, thing because uh, just doing what you're told doesn't make great research. Mm. And to succeed as a research, what, what would be the, the core things you need? Well, uh, I mean, there's a number of things and there's a, a little bit of a trade-off, right? Of, of course, it's, research is... It, it, it helps if you're brilliant in some sense at something. But it's also a lot of perseverance, mm. uh, hard work, uh, just the desire to, to, go, to communicate and to, to go ahead. So, um, and there's also different kinds of ability. Mm. Uh, as I said, the interpersonal, the uh, digging into sort of almost detective-like kind of thing, or the more mathematical. Or the more, so there's all kinds of different aspects of research. Mm. Are there any, any, you know, bright stars out there? Are there any forces to be inspired by? Any organizations or individuals that that uh, shine even brighter? Yes, uh, there are indeed. Uh, um, and it's it's wonderful to meet those. Uh, and uh, I don't know. Who are they? I, I well, who I don't know. That's uh, uh, one of my heroes in Sweden is Christian Assar, uh, uh, physical resource theory in Chalmers, in fact, who is uh, I think a, a great researcher. But you know, but there are there are, are many uh, who are inspiring and. Uh, Um, my hero, Elon Musk, ah, the game hero. changer. Yes. Are there any other game changers who really changed the course of history and the, the environmental history? Well, I mean, now I came to think of another researcher who is um, not only the uh, one of the few women to get the uh, Nobel Prize, and in this case in economics, but also... Uh, got it without being an economist, who was Eleanor Ostrom. Mm. Uh, you wrote a paper with her. Yes, recently. It's coming out. He recently published a paper that unfortunately she died in the middle of our writing the paper. Mm. But um, she was a great source of inspiration and uh, uh, really persevered. She had one idea <clears throat> um, to do with the, the so-called tragedy of the commons and she said that it's not a tragedy. Uh, the commons can be managed sustainably, and then she set out to kind of define how we should manage common resources. Mm. Mm. And uh, you have uh, educated and worked with a lot of people from, from uh, developing countries in Gothenburg <coughs> that yes. now are taking the... the taking lead in, in different countries around the world. That's been a great source of inspiration and... Uh, and uh, Wonderful, you know, experience. Thanks to the generosity of SIDA, the Swedish Development Agency, we had a program for uh, a couple of decades, and we had about 50 uh, PhDs who, who, PhD students who, who came from developing countries and who finished their PhD in, in Gothenburg, and, and who have gone home to their countries, 
and in a couple of cases they become ministers of, of environment, sometimes they're advisors to the president, or they are teachers and they do research and, and teach a, a whole new generation of, of students. And we have a, like a club, the Environment for Development Initiative. We meet, I was recently, I was, just came back from Vietnam, where we had an annual meeting and about a hundred came there from Latin America, from Africa, from mm. Asia, and we discussed our research and we do this every year. And uh, how will history remember Thomas Stanner? What's your, what's your biggest uh, <laughs> no, <I> accomplishment <laughs> to uh, uh, society? <laughs> That's hard to say. <laughs> uh, if, if what's your magnum opus? <laughs> Well, I have a book on policy instruments that I hope will be remembered, and I think that the environment for development will continue, so all our students in developing countries, will, uh, and in Sweden for that matter, will continue to spread things. Mm. And I hope people will remember that gasoline taxes are good. <laughs> <laughs> Unless if you go to... You don't have a car, so I guess it's uh, even better for you. <laughs> Indeed. That's a cheap way with it. It <laughs> doesn't is. matter how, how expensive the gasoline tax uh, becomes. Yes, yes, it's, it's true. The so you, way. you might say, well, of course, of course, um, I realize. I mean, there are people who have cars unnecessarily. And if you live in a, if you live in a big town in the center, uh, often an electric bike and uh, and then renting a car when you need one is actually the best solution. Yeah. But I realize that if you live in, in, in many smaller towns and in the countryside, you, you may, in fact, need a car. Mm. Uh, so so it's uh, not to be taken too but literally. It's a, a good investment in, in, in the body as well. Indeed. Yes. Cars. Uh, warm thank you and the best yeah. of luck in your important research. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks a lot.